Hi everybody. Thanks for having me here at Prisma Days. Uh, I'll be talking about the Jamstack and your data today. Um, it's a topic that I haven't gone into real depth with before, but I've definitively been giving this a lot of thought and talked a lot about it internally. And it's something that uh, that I do think will play a, a, a big role in the future of the Jamstack and the web. Just a little brief background of, on me. I'm Matt Billman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Netlify. Um, Netlify is the fastest way to build the fastest sites. We've uh, been around for more than five years now. We have close to a million developers on our platform um, and have really built the whole platform around this idea of the Jamstack architecture as a better way to build faster and more scalable websites and web applications. Let me start by just talking a bit about the Jamstack and, um, and the fundamentals of this, of this architecture. Um, when we talk about the Jamstack, we're really talking about like the evolution of the web and not so much about a, a specific stack of a set of technologies, but more about their philosophy and an architecture. You could say that the stack today has moved up a level. Um, if we look sort of way back in the early days of the pre-web, we had this very clear Unix model with a client and a server. Then during the whole period of sort of the 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 web 2.0 and a lot of the, the discovery of e-commerce and social networks and all of that, we sort of built this whole a dynamic database-driven web application where you would have a client, in this case, the browser that would talk to a web server, sometimes through a load balancer and a layer of caches and so on. And then we would have an application server that would talk to a database that would get back data. We would like use that data to take templates and assemble back HTML that we could send back to the browser. and. And that way we could build like advanced functionalities like form handling or e-commerce or search or so on and so on. And then by now we've sort of really shifted to a, to a modern web model where we are expecting like to have this kind of pre-built front end that lives directly on a global content delivery network or an application delivery network. Um, where the browser will like very instantly fetch the front end and then talk no longer to one server, but to all these different services. If we take another look at sort of the, the architecture and the difference between the Jamstack architecture and the modeling architecture, it's, it's no coincidence that, that, that the that the Jamstack doesn't really in its name, like it's JavaScript API and markup, but it's no longer the name of a specific web server or a specific database or a specific programming language. It's more this sense that the stack has moved up a level. And today as developers, we built for the edge for code that runs directly in the browser and talks to all these different APIs. Now, um, what we, what what we saw an opportunity to do at Netlify when 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 we launched was really to go in and say like okay so when you're building in this way when you take this approach there's all these different set of tools that that starts becoming a part of of building for this stack you obviously need to to develop locally you need like to build and test when you have this concept of like delivering a pre-built front end directly from a CDN, you always get this CI CD pipeline, you get this deployment step where you want to be able to guarantee atomic deploys with instant cache invalidation, where you don't have to worry if different parts of the of the site are out of sync with each other. You obviously have a hosting component where you do need that that end result to live somewhere. We started to see serverless function play a, a really important role in this whole world. And, and obviously you want that final end result to live, to live directly on, on a global delivery network. So what we saw an opportunity to do with Netlify early on was say like, okay, there should be like one single seamless workflow where you can develop, build and test, deploy, host, work with serverless functions, have the edge handlers included and so on. And, and Developers shouldn't have to think about all these different vendors uh, stitching together all of these different tools. It should be enough to just work locally, push to Git, and then know that the rest just flows naturally from there. Now, 
if we look back at sort of the traditional server rendered web, we had in that middle step in the in the diagram before. We had this concept of like a browser sending a request to a server, and then a lot of work would be done on the server. We would build the templates, talk to the database, all of this to to be able to like make sure that every page view had its unique representation and so on. And from from the world of that, we sort of entered into the world of of this concept of single page applications, where where we say, okay, all the server does is basically just deliver a little bit of HTML, and then all the rest of the work can be done by the browser, right? Like this, this is how uh, app.netlify.com is built, for example. It's a typical like traditional single page application where all the all the rendering happens in the browser. The browser will talk to our API and to a couple of other APIs like GitHub's APIs and GitLab's API and to a couple of serverless functions and so on, right? But all the server does in that case is just gives you a really small app shell that the that the browser can can spin up and operate from. Really similar to what what you would imagine from like a mobile application or something like that, right? You basically just have an application, a client that talks to these different services. And there's not really like when you do move around in the UI, there's no involvement from, from the server in that way. Now, when we talk about the Jamstack, there's sometimes this misconception that the Jamstack is just about like static site generation or something like that. And it's not so much like that. That's not the core of it. The core of it is taking this approach where, where at runtime, the server does almost no work. The server is typically just a CDN edge node that just delivers you your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript, and delegates the rest to the browser. But we start really taking serious this whole build step where before that happens, we can pre-build a lot of the different sites, a lot of the interaction. We can generate as much HTML upfront um, and, and, and we can communicate with APIs. We could do a lot of the heavy lifting at that step. So the work done by the browser becomes much smaller as well. And that's the way we get the ideal world of the, of the best performance and the best end user experience. And if we look sort of after that build step, right? Like once we have the build, we'll distribute the, the front end to all these different edge nodes there will typically still be some kind of runtime, some kind of runtime outside of the browser, right? Like the JavaScript layer will talk to sometimes different cloud functions, sometimes different APIs and services. And if we look at these APIs, we, we might sometimes talk to the APIs directly from the browser. And sometimes we'll have serverless functions that serves as an intermediary and talk to the APIs on, 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 our, on, on the user's behalf. A really classical example would be something like using Stripe, where Stripe as an API both both offer a, a bunch of widgets that you can pull in directly from the from the client side when you do the actual credit card input and so on. That that all happens client side. You don't need any backend for it. But then the moment you actually want to execute a payment, it, make a charge against the credit card, you need some server somewhere. That, that has the secret API token for Stripe that can actually do that final transaction and send it back, right? And that's one of these things where before, before the sort of whole Jamstack approach or before the serverless functions got introduced into this world, we, we would always get to this point where like, as a developer, I actually had now to think about having a server somewhere running. I had to think about my, my server even if it was just for that little interaction, I had to think about like, where is it? What kind of server is it? Is the software on the server up to date? Am I, am I, do I have monitoring on the server? Do I know if it will be around? Do I know how many times it restarts? What happens when it restarts? Do I need two servers so I can load balance and restart them one at a time and so on and so on. And that whole API layer now has gone from like, a couple of them to, to a very broad ecosystem that's all available to us as developers whenever we want to build sites or applications with this approach. Uh, services like Contentful or Snipcard, tool, tools like Gatsby or uh, Dato CMS or the like. And if we think about sort of a, 
an approach to a modern application and and how we would architect it and build it if we think about like a, a typical e-commerce application for example we might have that built layer where i said like we we try to push as much of the work we can in there we might try to pre-build as much of all of the different product pages we can by talking to a bunch of different APIs, right? We might talk to our main content API. We might get inventory and sizes and customer ratings and prices and related items from different services at the build time before anything happens in the, in the browser. And then on the other hand, once the user is in front of the site, we might do things like personalization, advanced search, or the actual e-commerce functionality of buying an item or going through the, the, the checkout by having like our front end talk to different APIs and services. And if we go back here and, and, and look at this old diagram around the evolution of the web and, and how it happened, right? Like one of the things that's interesting is that when we look at the legacy web, the database is like a big part of it, right? We have this concept of my database, the first way the, the first place I learned to build dynamic web applications back in the day was, was from the tutorials at MySQL's website around database-driven websites, right? It was really this concept of like, I have my website and I have my, my database. When we look at this modern web diagram, there's no database mentioned. So what does that mean? Well, if we go back to, 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 to our fictitious e-commerce app, we might think like, okay, maybe in the, at build time, we're talking to Contentful and we're pulling in products and prices from Shopify. We might use a couple of other services. Maybe when you go to the app, we might be using Auth0 for login and authentication. We might do all the fancy search elements through Algolia. Who knows, maybe we have like some application specific data in FaunaDB that sort of glues together a couple of the different services and keep tracks of how they're related. Um, and when we think about it, like obviously each of those very much have a database, maybe multiple databases, right? Like Contentful definitively feels like a database. We, we stuff things in there and get things out of it. Shopify has our whole product database. Auth0 has our user database with, out of, with, with all our user data. Algolia is a, is a very optimized search database. Fauna is a globally distributed NoSQL database that, that, that we can talk to. So it's not that we've gotten rid of the database, but it's that we've gotten rid of the concept of my database. And, and instead we have all these different sources of data. And, and you think about this, this old world of my app, and my database, then the new world looks more just like my UI, my front end. Maybe we even have different front ends. Maybe we have mobile applications as well. Maybe we have kiosks in an actual store. And then my data, like we no longer think about my database, right? You don't talk about Contentful or Stripe as my database for orders or for, or, or for content. Don't talk about of as my database for users. But you do think about my data, right? Like here's my user data. Here's my content. Here's my orders. Here's my e-commerce. So. In the old world, not only would we have my database, right? But you would also have like my server with the that's currently the primary. You would have like your secondary. You would have the backups, right? And we would think carefully about like, oh, what's the instance size I'm currently running this data on? What's the disk size? How much can I stuff into this database? Do I need sets, replica sets? What what do I need to do to scale? Can I scale horizontally or vertically? all of these things, you talk about provisioning and so on. On the other hand, when I add Auth0 to, to my website to authenticate users, I just expect it to be there, right? Like I don't expect to worry about any of those concerns, like where, where do they get stored? How is the replication working? How do I scale it? When I activate Algolia, I just start sending data into the index and then I just expect to be able to query it, but I don't, worry about instance sizes or disk sizes for, for my index. And the same with, with a contentful, I set up a space for my content and I just expect my editors to be able to, to work there. And I don't have to, to worry about any of the physical details around that data. And we're even starting to see like general purpose databases that acts and feels in this way. When, when I 
act, like when I start using a FornaDB distribution from 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 their cloud product, I don't start thinking about like which regions is it distributed in, how is the clustering working, what's about the replication. I just sort of turn on a database and start expecting there to 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 be data. So. In a similar way where, where if we had the legacy step with, with the client, the web server and the app server, just that code layer, and we had that sort of monolithic application that would live on the app server, then whenever we, we did something there, we had to think about that app server, right? Like back in the day, like you would have your server and you would like lock into your server with SSH and keep track of it and update it. You would provision servers. You would worry about like the load balance and thing. You would think like, oh, do I need some form of auto scaling? If a lot of people come to my app servers at the same time, how do I manage that? What about monitoring? Like I need to know if my server is actually running or if it's disappeared or if it's restarting or if it needs to be updated. I need to manage Linux updates and system updates of all my packages. Yeah, I need to make sure, like, I need to even consider what kind of OS, like, do I want to run Ubuntu or Debian and so on on, 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 my, on my server? And once we sort of transition to the Jamstack, we have this pre-built client directly out of an edge network. And then a lot of the code that's not, like, just in APIs, we'll just write in serverless functions, right? And instead of, like, this monolithic application, we just we just write our functions and then we just expect them to run. We we don't expect any operations. We don't expect to worry about like what's the instance type of my functions, uh, how is the auto scaling working? Do I need to actually check if they are up or down or if they're getting restarted? We've sort of accepted that that's that's just a, a service that takes care of that. We just write the code and then expect it to run. And one of the things that I think will happen with data when we talk about the Jamstack is that developers will start having the same kind of expectation that we'll start imagining data functioning in the same way. In the old world, we would always think about like database provisioning and there's still a world like most of us is, are, are definitively still there. Uh, we'll think about database provisioning. We'll think about replication, instance sizes, how much do they cost? How do we scale them? How many do we need? We'll think about which regions our data should live in and be like, do, do we make sure we do cross-region replication for safety? Well, very much like anyone that's ever run a database has probably run out of disk space sometime. I know I have. We'll think about backups and hopefully we'll think really carefully about it because it's like essential to, to recovering from errors. And I feel like once we really start applying the same kind of approach that, that, that we're seeing around the rest of the whole infrastructure where we basically just write our code, we push to Git, and then we expect everything to just happen from there. We'll also move to a world where developers will just expect like, okay, I have some kind of bucket, just write data and query data, and that's it. I don't have to worry about the rest. That's exactly what's already in, in some ways happening as we start delegating to these different services, right? Like as soon as you activate a contentful space, you don't think about provisioning or backups or replication or regions. You just expect it to be there and now you can write to it and read from it. When you set up off zero, you just think, okay, now I can start having users sign up or, or, or delete themselves and I can query users and they are just there and I don't have to worry about the data. So in some way we are moving towards this general concept of our data being no longer in one specific database. I no longer have my database, I just have my data. And it's distributed across all these different services. And we're starting to see these generic databases emerge that works in the same way where, where FaunaDB or Firebase just feels like, okay, I turn it on, I start putting in data and I start getting out data and I'm no longer concerned about the, the operations around it. So I think, as we move further and further into the world of the data, we're starting to, to of the Jamstack, we're starting to think of our data layer in that sense of just this distributed layer of services that exists around different properties and that I as a developer no longer have to worry about as, in, as the underlying abstractions of. Now, of course, one of the things that happens there is also certain fragmentation. 
Now my user data might live in one service. My content might live in a different service by a completely different provider. Now my products might be over in, in a Shopify and, and completely different provider again. My subscriptions might be located with Stripe in a different provider in a different place. My permissions might be in my own database managed by, by, by a different provider and running in a different place and so on and so on. So in one of the last thoughts I'll, I'll leave you with in, in this talk, it's not so much a, a, a specific prediction or specific insight on, on where we are now or, or how to do things, but more about what will happen next. And I think there'll be some sense of like, and I, and I have here in this chat sort of a, a set of disparaged logos that are not necessarily strictly related in any way, but it's an interesting area to look at. Like once we have all of these different services that, that persist our data and that we write to and read from, how do we actually start getting some unifying, unified way of, of, of thinking about it and querying about it? How can, how can we have systems that, that abstracts, just like Netlify has, has done from the whole process of writing code to having it run on, on an edge network through build processes and continued deployment processes and atomic deploys and hosting of serverless functions and so on. Well, we start seeing some similar layers like Take Shape is are, are, are working on the idea of a, of, of a content mesh like that that allows you to to tie together services like Contentful and Shopify and have like one unified GraphQL API to access them both and where you can write and read from both as if they were one thing. A service like OneGraph is trying to sort of do that across all this landscape of APIs and provide like live subscriptions through GraphQL across different APIs and allowing joins and complex like complex operations. Apollo has obviously been <clears throat> been been in the space of, of GraphQL for a while and have like often this concept of an enterprise having their whole internal graph of, of all their services and API exposed as one unit that their front end web developers can sort of just build around. And of course, Prisma is sort of defining this new generation of query layers um, and and ways to to think about data in a in a way that's more agnostic to the to the specific databases and and closer to the way we we work at the code level so i imagine that over time we'll see products that 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 go more and more in this direction of saying like once we fully adopted this jamstack approach where we have a front end that lives directly on the edge that has a big build step and so on and where we no longer have our app server and and our application, but just like our front end and all these different APIs and services and where we no longer have our database, but just our data. How do we start gluing that data together and how do we get a, a, a more a unifying work way of working with it as developers? And um, how do we get like to a point where we don't necessarily feel the weight of all the underlying vendors as, as much as we do today? I'll leave you on that thought. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, there'll be a short QA session and uh, I'm happy to chat about this with any of you. Uh, it's an area I'm, I'm really interested to also hear uh, your all thoughts around. Thank you.